I don't know about you, but it feels like more and more organizations and companies are shifting their virtual engagements to in-person. So I wanted to ask our loyal podcast listeners, do you know of an event that a company or association is hosting that would benefit from an in-person speech? I teach how to use storytelling to make a greater impact, how to build a greater team, and the habits of high-performing individuals. If you have a connection, I'd be honored. My email address is don at donyeager.com. That's don at D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R.com. If you email me, trust me, I'll reach back out to you and we'll even send you a book to say thanks. I appreciate you. What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learn important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shape their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community, I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is John Bacon. John has written 12 books, including five New York Times bestsellers on sports, business, health, and history. He teaches at the University of Michigan, where he leans on his three decades as a writer and journalist. John's newest book, let Them Lead highlights what business leaders can learn from the hockey rank. I have my notepad ready, and I hope you do too. You've got to be patient with results, but impatient with behaviors. It's extreme in both cases. I'm going to be incredibly patient with results individually and as a team, but incredibly impatient with behavior because we control that every day. You've got to work hard, you've got to cheer for your teammates around the track every day, no exceptions. When you lose a trend in 13 to 2, you are very patient about it. Did we work hard? Yes. Did we support our teammates? Yes. Okay. And walk out with your head held high. John, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Don. Pleasure to be on and with one of the guys whose books and articles I've read for many years. So good to meet you in Zoom person. It's so funny. Whenever people say that, suddenly there's that part of you that goes, oh, wow, that feels good. And then the other part means for many years means I'm old. <laughs> I get that. I'm feeling it right now. So beats the alternative, as you know. So it's true. It does beat the alternative. You know, I'm really excited to talk to you about sporting experience because your sporting experience actually influenced one of your best selling books called Let Them Lead Unexpected Lessons in Leadership from America's worst high school hockey team. That's so classic when you get to use such a definitive word like worst in a book title. Can you take us back to the 1980s when you were a student at Huron High School in Ann Arbor playing hockey? Tell me about your time on the ice. In a nutshell, the team was really good and I was on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Which meant you were in the picture. I was in the team pitcher. I cheered on a lot of good teammates. We had a serious team. We were a Final Four team my senior year. We had a player, Brad McCaw, who played for Michigan and his top 10 scorer all time. Played for Barry Melrose in the high minors and would have made it, but he blew out his knee. And then there's me. I'm skipping ahead here a little bit, Don, but why not? I still hold the record, not bragging, just saying. For the most games in a Huron uniform, 86 on varsity all three years, with the fewest goals, zero. Brad McCauley's records have been broken, but not mine. That zero is very hard to beat, Don. You know what? That is really powerful to know that you hold a record that will likely stand forever. How can you beat it? I played in every game. And by the way, folks, I played right wing. Although, as I think you already know, Don, having read the book, it is in fact a family record. I share it with my brother, who is also on the team and also failed to score. But as he likes to point out, he was a goalie. He played goalie. We all got excuses. <laughs> exactly. I mean, come on, tell him to just back off and enjoy the fact that you share this in common. Thank you. Now, you were coached by Bob Perry and Steve Cochran. What were you learning other than the ability to cheer for your teammates 
What was sports teaching you there in that time window? A lot of things. Some of them felt good and some of them didn't. Bob Perry's a really good guy. He owned a local furniture store and he came over at three o'clock every day to coach us, which is very nice of him to do. And it pays nothing, of course. Steve Cochran was a great guy and a big fan of mine. So I always appreciated that. And Bob knew hockey and had done very well previously at AAA teams and whatnot. I will say that one thing I did learn, though, is the star system is corrosive. Like most teams, the stars had one set of rules and guys like me had another. The bus was not waiting for me. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Given my status on the team, mainly as a penalty killer, it was not going to be me who spoke up. I can guarantee you that. Well, I must say my teammates to this day have never treated me differently. We're still very good friends, and they consider me a full-fledged member of the team. And at one point, the coach wanted to let a player, our star player, who had screwed up during the week, and he was in the stands. He wanted him to play the second or third period, and he asked who objected. And a better player than yours truly raised his hand, which took some guts, and said he did. And he had overruled. He played anyway. But what I learned from that, and this definitely applies to business, I'm one year younger than you are, for the record, and we've been doing the same kind of work for 30 or so years. We know a lot of teams. Almost every coach, almost every boss, I think most teachers, will play favorites. You got one set of rules for the stars, the top salesperson. I got another set of rules for the accountant in Sector 5G. Once you set that up, you have demotivated both sides of it. That's what people don't realize. It's not like corrosive for the people like me who want a fair shake and not a, a chance to get that job. It's corrosive for the person who has the job because they know they're not going to take it away no matter what. So the starter is demotivated and the people behind them are also demotivated because they know that no matter what happens, that guy's going to keep the top spot. Keep it as close to a strict meritocracy as you can. So whoever's playing better on Friday gets to start on Saturday. That way, the guy with the job is motivated to keep it. And the guy who is number two or three or four, he's motivated to get it because he knows if his numbers are 0.5 better, he'll get it. The star system is demotivational for everybody, even the stars. So when I became head coach, I tried not to do that. But again, I don't look back with bitterness. Bob was a good guy and a good coach. I had this conversation once with Coach John Wooden pretty great basketball coach. Even he acknowledged that best as he tried to be even keeled there and to have a set of rules. I mean, telling Bill Walton, you're off the team if you won't shave because that's the team rule. And if you don't want to follow the team rule, we'll miss you. He did his best, but he recognized that even in his best, there were moments and periods in which he, you just, it's human nature sometimes to favor into that spot and to favor into people who you think are contributing more. It was an interesting, very long discussion about how to lead in that space. So I'm fascinated to hear your perspective there. As difficult as it is, it's even more important that people pay attention to it. Don, I know exactly where you're going with that. I've had two chances to interview Coach Wooden over the phone, not in person. And I've read his books and he's clearly one of the great all-time leaders. I stole a lot of good ideas from him and they are good ideas and I'm not alone in stealing them. He's probably next to Lombardi, maybe the two most quoted stolen coaches out there. Like his notion that, okay, it's not equal, but it is fair. So while it is true that everyone's got to shave their mustaches off, and if not, Bill, we're going to miss you, as you pointed out. But the hot shots could be late for the boss and it's going to wait. The 12th man can't be late for the boss is going to take off. My mentor there is a guy named Al Clark at Culver Academies in Indiana, middle of nowhere. Started the program in 76 with an outdoor rink and 12 kids who had never skated before. Bought him skates in South Bend, about 45 minutes away. That's how in the middle of nowhere it is. Third year, they're state champs, and they were for eight straight years. And then the state of Indiana did not allow the A team to go, but then they had a B team, so that won it for another 10 years or so. That's how good Al is, and still has the record for the most wins of any high school coach in America with 1,017, I think. 25 NHL draft picks, nine NHL players, et cetera, et cetera. And his whole thing was the bus waits for no man. We're going to you know, Ridley College in St. Catharines, Ontario. It's a 10-hour bus ride. This guy is two minutes late banging on the side of the bus. And as Al said to me, the key word is he's banging on the outside of the bus. That means he's not inside the bus. So he is late and it's not fair. He's more than two minutes late. He's you know, 15 minutes late, really. And it's not fair to everyone else who was on time. So when I see him leave NHL draft picks in the parking lot, I realize you can do this. Now I admit, Don, on the high school hockey team, you hope this happens in November and not in March. <laughs> in November, we're not playing the big games yet. And make an example, now everyone's there half an hour early. Everything's cool. In March, man, it's way too late to get playoff games. So you hope it happens early if it's going to happen. And in March, maybe as the coach, you're driving by to pick him up. But <laughs> no, I get it. March is a test of nerves. Absolutely. Yes, right. You go on to University of Michigan, study journalism. But in 2000, 
You're invited back to become your high school's head hockey coach. Mm -hmm. Really great full circle moment there. But why did they ask you to come back and be the coach? And more importantly, talk to me a little more about year one there. They didn't ask me. The vote was four to two for the other guy. So how about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should not have gotten the job. And the four votes against me included the athletic director, who's an old friend of mine. She was my eighth grade math teacher and still voted for the stranger. <laughs> Her secretary, a parent who knew hockey, and our incoming captain. So this is not for you on against you. Now, two for me, another parent and our trainer, Rod Sorge, they would not take no for an answer. So they kept hammering the other four until finally, the AD, Jane Bennett, changes her vote to 3-3. Three, three. The principal picked me in a tiebreaker only because I had gone to Huron. He didn't know much about hockey. Worst player in school history, zero goals. Worst team in America, zero wins, 0-22-3. And, and I took him over. And they don't want you. So this is the perfect scenario for success. Oh, yeah. You are walking in. This is like you're walking on clouds, baby. Yes. Yeah, so all the managers out there say, you know, you're set up for failure. Oh, I got a story for you. <laughs> So they did not want me, and what do you do? The first thing I did was talk to Al Clark again, and he said, the first thing you've got to do is to make it special play for Huron. And I wisecracked that we're already the worst team in America at 0, 22, and 3. And for you non-sports fans, the zero is where the wins go, by the way, so <laughs> just to be clear. And he ignored my stupid little joke, and he said, no, the easiest way to make it special is to make it hard. Now, that seems utterly nonsensical, paradoxical. The easiest way to make it special is to make it hard. Because once something is hard, the right people are attracted to it. He's right. You wrote for Sports Illustrated, I freelance for them. Why is that cool? Because it's really hard even to freelance. Therefore, when you're on a plane and you say you write for Sports Illustrated, everyone's impressed. Navy SEALs, the average salary is $54,000 a year. Yeah. That is poor by public school standards. It's incredibly dangerous, it's incredibly uncomfortable. You're in 120 degrees in Baghdad or minus 20 in the North Pole or whatever. And they only take 6% of those who apply. And Peace Corps pays you a few hundred bucks a month, and they take one out of six applicants. So how can they afford to be so picky when their pay is much lower than whatever corporations you're talking about are paying? Their conditions are far worse because they're selling a mission. Instead of denying that it's hard or apologizing for it, they celebrate the fact that the hard is the point. It's the great line from Tom Hanks in A League of Their Own. The hard is what makes it good. And so you celebrate the hard. My first letter to the team was congratulations. You are trying out for the hardest working high school hockey team in the state of Michigan. And there are 200 teams at that time in the state of Michigan. And we were the hardest working high school hockey team in the country. We're on the track one week after school got out in the weight room. Before the summer is done, everyone on the team is thrown up on that track, including me and my assistant coach, Mike Lapridge. Not one player quit. And I can't pay them. The workouts are voluntary. They don't have to show up by state law. And we're not talking about self-selecting Navy SEAL candidates here. We're talking about the worst team in America. And I was told all the things you hear about millennials and Generation Z, they're lazy and selfish and entitled, not one player quit. So the sense of mission is what drew them into this and made them work so hard. So that's what you got to do. The opposite of kombucha machines and Taco Tuesdays and everything else. That stuff, they may like it, but you will not get any more work out of them. That is such a great point. The hard is the point. Love it. So. You've made two references to Al Clark already, and I'm going to admit I, I didn't know the name until reading some about you. Tell me, how did that relationship, how did you develop? Because it's very obvious he became quite the mentor to you. Still is. How did that develop and flourish? Partly dumb luck, no question about it. My first job out of Michigan, and uh, we didn't have journalism at Michigan, unfortunately. So I was a history major pre-unemployment, Don. So <laughs> how about that? So what do you do with a honors degree in history from Michigan, you get a job at Culver Academies as a faculty intern, making $9,000, high four figures. How about that? It's really paying off. High four. High four, baby. I went to Culver because Al Clark was there. I'd already seen what an amazing program it is. So I, good tip for everybody, forget about making money your first job out of college, get mentors. Mentors are far more important than money, especially starting out, because the money's gonna be crap anyway, frankly. I got under Al's wing, I babysit his kids, seven and five year old Jeff and Allison, and I picked his brain every chance I had. And from him, I learned a good chunk, not all, but a good chunk of what I needed to know when I became the head coach. I was on the phone with that guy once a week easily for all four years that I coached. And this is another important point. Once you become a leader, get help. The new leaders, whether they're young or old, doesn't matter. But if you're new to it, 
the temptation is to come across as omniscient, omnipotent. I know everything. I'm all powerful. I don't need any help. Help is a weakness. That guy is in trouble. That guy will have no safety net when he starts to fall and he's going to. So I got a ton of help. And chapter four is make sure you're the dumbest guy in the room. And I was. So in fact, Don, I exceeded my expectations. How about that? You exceeded your expectations as the dumbest guy in the room. I love By it. By far the dumbest, not even close. <laughs> yes. So in those early days, when you're getting a chance to work with an Al and you're taking that opportunity, you're not just going there to work and learn. You're going there to figure out each and every opportunity, even down to babysitting his kids, that would provide for you an open door to learn. Absolutely. And the better guys out there, you'd be amazed how many big shot leaders, and Al's a big shot in high school hockey, will help you. But the babysitting man, A, I like the kids, and they're still good friends of mine. They're in their 30s now. Nah, they might be in their 40s. <laughs> still love those guys. We're still in touch, so I enjoyed it. But that was to curry favor with Al, undeniably, because I needed his help. I, I wanted to sit next to him on the buses, you know, going to Boston and everything else. So, and Al did that for me. Most good folks will help you if you ask, but you have to ask the right way. Isn't that true? What a great lesson. You know, we mentioned Coach Wooden already. I actually had a mentoring relationship with Coach Wooden that lasted 12 years. And it began when I was working on a story and met him and realized afterward that he was serving as a mentor to others. I asked him how someone could be mentored by John Wooden. And he said, you ask. And I asked him how many people asked the question. And he said, not as many as you might think. Most people select themselves out by saying, there's no way John Wooden would ever mentor me. So they don't ask. He said, if you step forward and ask, you know, you're one step better than everybody else. And a month later I asked, and for 12 years we went forward, which was really quite life-changing for me. What would a CEO pay for that? Exactly. I have 500 hours of recorded conversation with John Wooden, which is really incredible. Holy smokes. Because you asked. And frankly, I interviewed Coach Wooden twice. I don't know. I'd sadly be one of the self-selecting guys who probably would not have asked him, despite my lecture on this. <laughs> Al Clark, yeah, but uh, John Wooden, I'd probably be too timid. That's just a sign that I'm even less bright than you are. <laughs> I didn't know not to ask. <laughs> so we're talking about that team, 0, 22, and 3, year before you got there. But three years later... The team is 17, four and five, ranked fourth in the state, 53rd in the nation. And I love the way you phrased it. We leapfrog 95% of the team is in the nation. Really incredible. There's some business lessons that are important in the, and you teach them to businesses as part of what you've done with this book and with your story. How did you build the turnaround? Slowly, certainly at first. Which is so important. Everybody wants the microwave behind you, but the truth is it's not an overnight process. Yeah, you've got to be patient. Now, here's the weird thing, and it's one of the chapter titles. You've got to be patient with results, but impatient with behaviors. You have to separate the two. I love that. It's extreme in both cases. I'm going to be incredibly patient with results individually and as a team. I will never get mad for a loss, even a horrible 13 to 2 to state champion Trenton. This is not high school football, people. This is hockey. And those come in increments of one. So if I were to count to 13, you'd know how what a horrible night that was. I knew their fight song by the end, Don, so <laughs> that's how bad that was. But incredibly impatient with behavior because we control that every day. And what you also want long term with that, putting values over victories, your principles over your profits. Those principles can be there every day of the job, no matter what happened, account you lost, account you gained, bad hit with government regulations or whatever else. You know, you're going to have ups and downs with all that stuff. You should not have ups and downs with your values. You should not have ups and downs with your principles. John Wooden, if there's an example of that, boy, he was one. So our two values were very simple. Work hard and support your teammates. That's it. And I stole that from Rob Palmer, a Michigan All-American hockey player. I skate with on Tuesday nights, played in the NHL for six or seven years, and then got his MBA. And he said all his dad in Toronto told him was work hard, support your teammates. And leaving the rink one night, I thought, that's it. Mm. As I say, simple but not easy. So that's all we focused on. And on those things, I'm utterly impatient. Day one, you got to show up on time, dressed appropriately, ready to go. Got to work hard. Got to cheer for your teammates around the track. Every day, no exceptions. When you lose a trend 13 to 2, you are very patient about it. Did we work hard? Yes. Did we support our teammates? Yes. Okay. And walk out with your head held high. This is a very valuable, especially in turnarounds, because you're going to have losing streaks on a turnaround. If you're taking over a bad division, a bad company, whatever else, it ain't going to happen overnight. Like you said, it's not microwave. So you got to be patient. 
And that will get you through that period right there. Best coaching ever did was when our team, our first year, we won our first three games and that equaled the win total from the two previous years combined. So as my dad said, Don, when you're on the floor, you can't fall out of bed. So thanks, dad. <laughs> he is not a motivational speaker. I'll say that. <laughs> After those three wins, we go, O for December and January, which is pretty bad for a high school hockey team, 10 straight losses. And that was my best coaching by far because nobody gave up. Nobody pointed the fingers. We kept showing up and we kept getting closer and closer and closer. Every night, they believed they could do it. And that's hard to keep going. The easiest coach I ever did was my third year when we had a 14 game winning streak. Fill out the lineup, man. I, that team's ready to go. You got to work on some things and watch some things. But winning teams are a whole lot easier to coach than losing teams. So we were patient with the results, but impatient with the behaviors. That was crucial. Be patient with the results, not patient with behaviors. I can't wait to hear your speech one day because, uh, in fact, you did a TED Talk and you laid out those two rules about working hard and supporting your teammates. When you're sharing that into the business world, some of those things are easy to measure in a sporting team, right? Work hard. What I mean, you can see it. People can hide in cubicles and work hard becomes a little harder sometimes to measure. Sure. How are you helping businesses think about those two lessons and apply them into what they're doing? Well, first of all, as far as trying to figure out who's working hard and who isn't, amazingly, if you did a poll, and I've done this, 10 people in an office and rank them, the rankings are almost identical across the board. Somehow everyone knows who's who. It is hard to tell in an office versus a hockey team or a track team. Track team, you're running harder, you're not. It's, I can see you do it. Right. So it is harder. You're right about that. But it's not that much harder. Second of all, we measured a ton of things. And the Hawthorne effect indicates just by measuring something, it gets better because people are alert to it. I use a spreadsheet when I talk to companies. We had 15 measurements every game on every player, which is hard to believe you can do that in a high school hockey team. We had freshmen who took the stats and all that. But we broke it down all kinds of ways. And what's good about that is, okay, goals and assists matter, but the leading scorer has always got a ton of positive reinforcement. What about the solid defenseman? What does he have? Well, he's got plus minus, block shots, hits, pancakes, all kinds of other stuff that we look at that tells you there are a lot of ways to contribute to this team. We didn't tell them which was more important and which wasn't. And Pete, you're my assistant coach, Michigan NBA guy. We break down those stats every night after a game for two hours. We'd print the spreadsheet on the wall as they walked in. We didn't have to tell them to go look at it either. The first thing any high school kid is going to do, or any adult for that matter, is walk right to the grid, showing the results from the night before, and see how they did on all these measures. We don't have to tell them where to get better and where not, you know, where they're strong. They already can see it. So it becomes very much self-coaching. Let them lead is the title of the book. So measure a lot of things, measure everything you can, and just post it without comment. And that does an, a very good job of making sure everybody's working hard and they know where they're working hard and where they aren't. When they come in for a pay raise or promotion, you've got all the stats. You say, well, here's where you're strong and here's what I want to see. I'm not seeing this. Your expense reports are habitually late. Your customer satisfaction is not that high. Your sales are good. These things you can break down pretty readily. So that is big as far as supporting your teammates go. They already know that too, but you start encouraging that by breaking down barriers. Silos are death for team spirit. You can't have it. I can't have goalies versus defense versus forwards. We talked about team defense. Puck scores, all six of you screwed up in some way or other. I don't berate them for that, but it's everybody's responsibility. You could have stopped it way upstream, but it got downstream. In that sense, we can't have silos there either. So those two things are very much transferable to businesses. One more point, by the way, about the values, and this is important here too. One thing good about being a value-based organization, a principle-based organization is it allows you the luxury of defining yourself. Trent and beat us 13 to two. Okay, their fans think we suck. They're chanting at us. Their players show us no respect. In the high school, we might get called losers. Who knows? I don't care. All right, we have two values. Work hard, support your teammates. We decide who we are every night. And if we check those two boxes, we walk out of here with our heads held high and nothing else matters. And one of our lines was, everything we need to win is inside this room and nothing is outside it. It's you versus the world, and that's a good feeling, actually. So I'm throwing the whole kitchen sink at you, Don. Sorry about that. Plenty to chew on. No, it's great. So this concept of breaking down silos and the idea that silos are the death knell of many or organization, help me apply that into a business team, the silos that you would most worry about being destructive in an organization. Uh, I've done a lot of work with car dealerships, other organizations. Almost always, you get sales versus service. That's almost always one. 
cross training goes a long way, even for a day, because they have some sense of when the salesman promises this, guess what? I'm the guy who eats it a year later on the service desk because it's not true, it's not part of the warranty. And now I'm the bad guy explaining that to the customer. That's a small example, but cross training is a very good way to break down the silos. Badger Bob Johnson, one of my heroes at Wisconsin, of course, and coach the Pittsburgh Penguins. On Sundays, they'd have volleyball games or soccer games because guess what? The All-American hockey player is a crappy soccer player and the fourth liner is a good one. So you find different ways to mix things up. The company I'm working with now, uh, Fantasy Football League, because the drivers and the sales reps don't get along. Well, now you're gonna. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all gonna do the same thing. So that goes a long way. Also a very important concept we called layers of leadership. John Cooper, now of course, won two straight Stanley Cups with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Believe it or not, 20 years ago, he was coaching Lansing Catholic Central. His last year at Lansing Catholic Central was my first year at Ann Arbor Huron and somehow Don, our careers have diverged <laughs> and he's won two cups and I'm talking to you. <laughs> no, but you've got a cup on the shelf right behind you. Absolutely. I mean, it's a coffee cup. A salable fishing camp. Yes, right there. I'm going to guess he's jealous of you too. So, And this day he might be, he's working. Yeah. But from him, I got a great line. On bad teams, nobody leads. On good teams, leaders lead, coaches lead. On great teams, everybody leads. And that's kind of the point of this book. And leading by example is surely very important. And without that, you're a hypocrite and they're not gonna follow you and they shouldn't follow you, frankly. We work for editors like that. Do as I say, not as I do. Even back to your first example about putting the team out there on the track in summer, when you're talking about who was puking, it wasn't just the players, it was you too, which means to your point right now, you were out there on the track with them arm in arm as they were trying to make themselves better. You know what? I didn't realize until you brought that up. This book, I asked all the guys for their help. Now it's 20 years later, in many cases, 15 to 20 years later. I say, what do you guys remember? The stories, the insights. Most of them are leaders now themselves in various fields. And they sent me 150 pages of stuff, mm. which I tried to bake in as much as I could into the book. One of the biggest things that stood out repeatedly was that we were there with them on the track with batons running Michigan football stadium, 4,000 steps, uh, throwing up right alongside them. I don't know if I could do it now. I admit that, but at 35, I could. Well, you could probably throw up with them. I can, I, I can definitely throw up. I can pull some muscles. I can yeah, break an ankle. <laughs> I can do all the hard stuff. So that's true. But that mattered a lot to them. For us, we had a line on the team, a joke. We've got a name for those who lead by example. They're called sophomores. Because all that means is you know your job and you can do your job. That's why you got a jersey. It's why you got a cubicle in our locker room with your name on top and pretty cool stuff. As a freshman, we don't expect you to know very much. But as a sophomore, you know your job, do your job. As a junior, you know your job, you can do your job, you know everyone else's job too. As a senior, you know your job, you can do your job, you know everyone else's job too, and you help them do their jobs better, which make you more accountable and a ninth grader is going to listen to a 12th grader far more readily than he's going to listen to me. And that's true of your company also. That, yeah, management's management, but I'm trying to break that down also. The senior's got to do a job and a half. So it's not merely enough if you're a veteran employee in my company. It's not really enough for you to do your job. You got to help that guy, the new guy, do his job better. It'll increase your stature and it will help him. It helps everybody. And now we're leading each other. It's very much a, uh, a West Point model as you progress. Your job is to make sure that your responsibilities are progressing with you. I love that as a leadership discussion, leadership model. You know, you mentioned that you had a whole bunch of areas of measurement in business. I think you mentioned 16 different ways. Yeah. Some of the others that we might consider that we're thinking about, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I'll give an example. Beer distributor. How about that? That does most of the state of Michigan. I'm doing some coaching for them. They've got 30 or 40 sales reps. And they've got about 10 or 15 drivers. Each driver's got three or four sales reps whose orders they fill, you know, driving to Kroger's or whatever. And it's the same five or six sales reps who are always asking for a special favor. This guy's a great client. I need three cases. You don't take a Mack truck half an hour back to the warehouse for three cases. A hundred cases you will, but not for three cases. So we are now in the habit right now in the process of measuring who asks for the most special favors and who doesn't. Because they already know it's the same five or six guys. Now the sales guys, to their credit, came back with, okay, that's fair. You know what? It's also sometimes the same drivers who won't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to measure that too. That's how you start getting now. Whatever behavior you want to reinforce or change, you better start measuring it right away. And if you can't measure it, I don't know how it's going to get better. How are you going to lose weight without a scale? It's just not going to happen. 
I love it. That's so great. You know, we mentioned the learning and the lessons that you took from Coach Clark. You also reached out to a personal legend of mine, Herb Brooks. Anybody who knows the 1980 U.S. Olympic story, I had the chance to work with Jim Craig on a book. Great book. A great book. Thank you. But you're reaching out to Herb Brooks. You were getting there to learn from him while writing with him. What's the greatest takeaway you got from that relationship? He's revered in so many ways. Give me your greatest takeaway. I'd give you two big ones. Trenton beat us 13 to two the first time. Uh, USA Today called them the best high school hockey team in America, and not without reason. We proved it, I guess. A year and a half later, we got them in the regional final. We've gone from zero wins to 16. We got a pretty good team at this point, but and the scores against them were 13 to two, seven to one, six to two. We're getting closer, but we're not there yet. So I call this an advantage you have with John Wooden and one I had with Herb Brooks. Pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Not, not a bad source for this. You call up Herb Brooks and I say, Herbie, this is not about articles or books. We're playing Trent tomorrow night. Guess what? They're the Soviets and we're the Americans. What do I do here? <laughs> and he gave me great advice. He said with his flat Minnesota accent, and I know you've talked to him, Johnny, just tell him this. Above all, you got to believe. If you believe anything is possible, if you don't believe, nothing is possible, but it comes with a catch. Just because I believe and work my tail off and support my teammates does not mean we're going to win. The more I put into it, the more heartbreaking it's going to be. So that's the risk you have to take. But you know what? You're not going to win the lottery without a ticket. I guarantee you that. Having a lottery ticket does not guarantee success. You're going to win. But I guarantee you that not having one, you're not going to win the lottery. So your lottery tickets in this case are faith and hope and belief. You have to pour all that in before you get out there. And I told the team this, got them all jacked up. Then I turned and said, seniors, your room. And I walked out and man, those guys were breathing fire, screaming at each other. You could hear it through a big, thick metal doorway. And they went out there and the final score was three to two Trenton. But we outshot them 30 to 27. And after we lost, their fans gave our players a standing ovation out of recognition that this is not the same team they played a year and a half ago. That was 13 to two. In the handshaking line, Andy Green is in the team the year before. He's still in the NHL at age 38. That's how good these guys are. Their captain said to my captain, you guys should have won the game. That's a class act. So you got to believe. Without that, you have no chance. Does not guarantee success. The more you put into it, the more heartbreaking it will be. You're saying, look, if you want to overcome an opponent that might be mildly superior, maybe even greatly superior, you have to buy those lottery tickets. Faith, hope, belief. But the more you put into it, the more heartbreaking it's going to be if it doesn't happen. Now, the more savory it will be when it does. But I love that ability to kind of almost warn people. You're not guaranteed anything just because you happen to do these things. You hit the nail on the head. And as fast as I was going down with all that stuff, you burrowed down very nicely. <laughs> you might be a good journalist someday. So look into that. I take a lot of notes. Take a lot of notes. And that's why I keep writing down as we're talking. Well done. It sounds masochistic, but the heartbreak actually feels 10 times better than getting your butt kicked 13 to 2. Right. Yeah, they were crying and they felt heartbroken. But you know what? By the time they left the locker, showered up and left the locker room, and both teams and fans are cheering for them in the lobby, we're getting over it. So it's the right kind of heartbreak. And that heartbreak is the Teddy Roosevelt quote, the man in the ring. Mm -hmm. That guy knows, you know, the cheers of victory and the agony of defeat, et cetera. I'm butchering this, but he'll never be with those timid souls on the sidelines. So it's a heartbreak you can live with. And once we started winning games, including that one, um, we didn't win that game, but it was a great effort. Next year, we're 17, four and five, 14 win game winning streak in the middle. We didn't lose a whole lot. We won a number of trophies along the way, tournaments and so on. Herb Brooks. All credit goes to your people and none to you. And that sounds like a horrible deal as a leader. And in many ways it is. And I see you have the folded flag behind you. And you know, in West Point, leaders eat last. You know how this works. Okay. Yeah. And you know Herb and you know Jim Craig very well. Find me the picture, find me the videotape of Herb Brooks celebrating. And you can't. Because as you watch the clock go down, he makes sure it hits three zeros. Because who, who can believe it? He looks up, he goes like this. And he looks at his team with glassy eyes full of respect and admiration, and I think love is fair. And then what does he do? He walks beneath the stands and goes into a public locker room and cries in a bathroom stall. That's how he celebrated a dream that took him 20 years, as you know, to build. Mm. And I think to myself, how can you do that after all that? And he said, Johnny, I didn't make one goal, one pass. I didn't play on the team in 1960. I didn't play on it in 1980. 
Whatever happened out there was all they're doing. It'd be disingenuous, phony for me to take credit now. Wow. If Herb Brooks can walk away from the greatest upset in the history of sports, John Bacon can walk away from a Thanksgiving title in Traverse City. So what you do in that situation when they say, Coach Bacon, come get your trophy, you jam your hands into your pockets, all right? Glue them. And you nail your feet to the red carpet there, united your captain so he can go get his trophy, celebrate with his teammates, and you leave the ice. The second you take credit for their success is the second they quit working for you. And don't worry. If you're the head coach or the division head or the chairman, chairperson, whatever, you, if your team's winning, you will always get more credit than you deserve. And you've joked about, you know, Brian Kilmeade and your gigantic blockbusters and said, oh, you know, it's Brian and his, you know, man, don't worry. You'll get plenty of credit and you do. So don't worry about getting credit. It'll find you anyway. Well, I love that. Great advice, Jim. Your hands in your pockets and glue your feet to the carpet and let them step forward and do it. That is what a powerful, powerful lesson. Your leadership skill also showed itself in taking your laughter at yourself about the idea that you own that one record that will never be topped, 86 games, zero. But you've made fun of that enough that you're also able then to say, uh, okay, clearly it's there's a little scar there somewhere. So let's make sure that nobody else feels that same pain. Sure. In fact, one of the things I loved about this entire, you know, it's like the Scooter McGee story. Players on your team who you made sure they scored, even if it was the last game of their senior year, so that they didn't leave with the zero. Not that you wanted to own the record by yourself, but because you <laughs> wanted them not to feel what you felt. And the end result was it's a tradition. I mean, like your team will not experience that. Tell us about that need to kind of make sure that no one else kind of leaves with that zero. Sure. And that taste in your mouth. And look, I joke about it because what choice do I have, Don? <laughs> the number's not moving anywhere. We all joke sometimes about the things that do leave that little scar. Sure. And trust me, I would kill for having, and I can name the three pipes and the one crossbar I hit in my three years, <laughs> but I'm not better. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Clearly not better at all. So, although I have jokes with my teammates, if I ever did score, it would have cost me thousands of dollars in speaking fees. <laughs> scoring three goals is not nearly as good a story as scoring none. So, none, right. and likewise, the zero wins in the team before me. So, uh, but Scooter McGee, we've got a paragraph in our program. What we do, if you score a goal, one of the other players will grab the puck. We save it uh, till after the game. We write with a special pen, all the details. We have a big ceremony. So everyone's a hero before they're done, basically. It's kind of what I wish for myself, clearly. Mm. But it's far more fun with them. So Scooter McGee, we all loved him. Great you know, penalty killer, digger, third, fourth line player. Had not scored a goal. And by now, our second year, we've got a good team with two All-State players at forward. We're up three or four goals. I put Chris Fragner, who played for Michigan ultimately, and Pete Herringer, whom I think could have, and told those guys, okay, your job is to get the puck, pass, pass, pass to Scooter. If you shoot, I'll kill you. So you're not shooting. And Scooter, your job is to sit your butt in front of the slot, like one of the slot hockey players. You don't forecheck. You don't back check. You don't do anything I normally ask you to do. Wait for the puck. Bang it toward the net. All right. And we do this for four or five games, and it just won't go. And Scooter told me in the book that at first he just wanted to get it out of the way to get it done with. And then he realized that everyone else was so into it, including the fans, that he wanted to do it for them as well. We're up 5 nothing. We're all over him. And he's got a good team. So we put the scooter plan in place the last five, six minutes at least. And finally, the two stars come to the bench saying, we're gassed. We did all we could. And I said, I know you did. And I patted him on the head and loved those guys and said, you know, come on in. Ten seconds left. Scooter's still out there. I don't know how this happened. But he pickpockets their defenseman coming up the ice. He goes in 1-0 on and the Dexter goalie, bangs it, hits the stick, comes right back to him, incredibly. Bangs it again. I look in the corner at the ref. Boom, goal. And the bench just erupted. Everybody on the team 20 years later still remembers this. The crowd goes nuts. They know what we're doing. Our trainer said, I didn't know you could jump that high. I didn't either because <laughs> I'm not a jumper. And we all go nuts. 3.2 seconds left on senior night. That's kind of pretty close. But after the game, we have a big ceremony for Scooter. We go up the stairs afterwards. The crowd stays. We're late. But the crowd stays to cheer him on. He's laughing and crying at the same time. We walk out together. I put my arm around him and say, Scooter, I don't know about you, but I will never forget this as long as I live. And I'm telling you right now, yeah, I would have loved to have scored. I can't lie about that. 
no way any goal of mine could have ever equaled the feeling I still get thinking about Scooter's goal. And then Scooter says to me, coach, I'm not crying because I scored. I'm crying because it's over. Oh, man. <laughs> now you're killing me. Yeah. And yeah, Scooter's now a lawyer with the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm glad he's working hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We need him. But those stories you don't forget. And that's what you get when you put them in charge. But what I love is that that became a cultural piece of the organizational structure, right? Everybody was going to get that celebration to the place that the fans understood it. The fans waited around. It was not just being celebrated by you because you wanted to kind of get that zero off the books for him, but his teammates. And as you said, I guarantee you somewhere that puck, it's not lost in some collection of dusty relics. It's somewhere really cool for him. And I think that's neat. By the way, they also have them. Everyone I've talked to, 54 players over those four years. Scooter, I know, does. What was especially cool for me, talking to these guys all these years later, and we're still in touch. We got a barbecue in my backyard every summer for 17 years, so I still see them. They give me parenting advice done, and I have to take it. So <laughs> their kids are older than mine. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. So, But they all say, Chris Fagner you know, broke McCaughey's records. He's got a ton of records, played for Michigan. He says his favorite goal was Scooter's. It's shared. And by the way, when you have a team like that, you take care of each other like that, everybody benefits. It's not just the guy who scored and feels special. Everybody feels special to be a part of a team like that. These guys are honored and respected and valuable. What's so awesome is that 20 years later, they won't talk about the trophies when they gather together. They'll talk about that goal, right? They'll talk about 3.2 seconds. That's the beauty of team. And that leads me really to the last question I want to ask you. You do a podcast as well. So as you know, many of us who do podcasts, we have some questions, some theme that we try to make sure we carry one guest to the next. We ask every executive or every person that we have on the podcast, you've been a part of great teams. You understand what it means to be a team. Many in the corporate world use the word team to describe their structure, whatever it is. The truth is they're not a team. They just use the phrase because it sounds cool. If you are trying to help coach, which you do, a leader who has a bunch of individual contributors that he's called a team, if you're trying to coach him into building something that is, in fact, a team, what are some of the planks on the bridge that they have to navigate in order to really cross over? And you're right, because accountants all wear green shirts and are on this side of the cubicles. It means they have green shirts and they're on that side of the cubicles. That's all it means. Right. So you're dead right. And you worked with many corporations. I have too. And I've heard it, you know, the lip service a lot, but not too often have I seen the real thing. It's hard to affect. It's hard in their defense. But I'd say two things that I hit upon earlier. One is you got to break down barriers. It can't be accounting versus accounts receivable versus, you know, supply chain versus truckers. And people have to know each other. Al Gallup is a friend of mine former assistant principal of here in high school. He's now 96, a World War II hero. And he gave me a great line that I quoted him in the book. You cannot motivate anybody you don't know. And you really can't be teammates with anybody you don't know. So one of the simplest things, not that easy to do, is to find ways for everyone to get to know each other. Barbecues, fantasy football, field trips to a Detroit Tigers game, whatever you got. That needs to break down. We did a thing also called Senpai Kohai, which I stole from Japan. And I did that doing a story for ESPN Magazine, sorry, the rivals, uh, back in 98 after the Nagano Olympics, inevitably titled Puckymon for your old buddy Steve Wolf, actually, at ESPN. Absolutely. But from there, I learned this concept, Senpai Kohai, and every, every single Japanese organization does this. Toyota, Sony, this hockey team, you name it. And you got a mentor and a mentee. It's formal. You get matched up and you do things together. I realized I had to break it down. I got 12th graders about to go to Afghanistan. I've got ninth graders who aren't shaving and you know two years away from driving. So how do I do this? Senpai Kohai. And we did a matchmaking thing where I pick three and I try to match you up with one guy you picked. But you're sitting together on the team bus on our three overnight trips. You're rooming together. You eat together at team meals. And I wasn't sure if they're going to take to this or not, to be honest. It's kind of corny and it's Japanese, not American. But man the next year are we doing that again are we doing that again they ate it up and to this day they can still remember their senpai and their kohai most of whom appear in your wedding so that's how ingrained it was senpai kohai works really well for breaking down barriers second thing we already talked about make them accountable to each other 
through layers of leadership. That's how you really start bonding. It can't be labor versus management. That's not going to work. It's got to be everyone working together, which means layers of leadership help other people do their jobs better. And once that gets enforced, you start grading them all as a team. Warren Buffett had a lot of great lines. One of them is, show me your pay plan and I'll show you your employee's behavior. If part of your pay is a team pay, guess what? Your team's going to start doing better because you want the money. Mm -hmm. John, I know you do so many different things. How can folks make sure they find you? Thank you for that because I always forget. Let them lead by bacon.com is the website for the book, for speeches also, and for our new podcast. It's been out about two months or so, but it's doing quite well already. Let them lead. Talk to Jim Hackett, the CEO of Ford Motor Company, Greg Meyer, the 83 Boston Marathon champion, and a wide range of folks. A lot of fun. John, I thank you so much for the time, the wisdom, the pages of notes. I can't wait for our paths to cross again. And thank you today for joining us and being a corporate competitor. Well, appreciate that. Thank you, Don, for your great writing. I've enjoyed over the years, articles and books, of course. Now you're speaking of caught here and there, of course. And also, now I got bad news, pal. You're a role model. So more responsibility for you, pal. Now I'm going to go with Charles Barkley. I'm not a role model. <laughs> I know that quote, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the line that sticks out to me is this. Be patient with results but not behaviors. When I work with companies, I always encourage them to create a culture roadmap, guidelines that help employees understand the heart of your team, the essence of what it means to work alongside one another in your environment. For John, this was work hard and support your teammates. Are you clear on your culture roadmap? If you could share one habit one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that, uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K, how you doing? Hey Don, how you doing my man? Great sir, how are What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you. In my online course, journey to greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to journey to greatness is normally $399. But for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.